Hello, everyone. Uh, a big welcome. I'm very delighted to be here, and I'm very, very delighted to introduce our speaker and discussant for tonight. So we have Professor Sara Ahmed, who I'm sure all of you know is an independent feminist scholar and writer. Her work is concerned with how power is experienced and challenged in everyday life and institutional cultures. In recent years, she's worked on the intricacies and idiosyncrasies of diversity work in universities particularly. And she's recently completed a book, What's the Use on the Uses of Use, and those of you who came to the last lecture would know more about it, um, and has begun a new research project on complaint, which she'll talk more about in today's lecture. This scholarship has been incisive, challenging, and inspiring, and is particularly important at this moment when we are witnessing industrial action in this country over conditions in higher education, and many of us have been participating in that. So it has come at a very, very timely moment as well. Her lecture today is entitled Complaint as Diversity Work. Um, after the lecture, we'll have a discussion, and that will be led by Dr. Karen Salt. Dr. Karen Salt is based at the University of Nottingham. She's an interdisciplinary scholar with strong interests in transnational American studies and Afro-diasporic <coughs> studies. A significant portion of her work investigates how black nation states have fought for their continued existence within a highly racialized world. Dr. Salt is an expert on sovereignty, politics, and the ways that discourses regarding difference influence narratives, decision-making, and systems of governance. Dr. Salt is on the advisory board for AHRC, and she is also the director of the Center for Research in Race and Rights at Nottingham. She has a book that's coming out soon with Liverpool entitled The Unfinished Revolution, Haiti, Black Sovereignty, and Power. So the format for tonight is that there will be a lecture by Sarah followed by a discussion led by Dr. Karen Saul. Um, and I know that Sarah is also quite keen for the discussion to not be a conventional question and answer session, but for all of you to draw in your own experiences and have more of a conversation along that line. So I'll hand over to Sarah. Thank you. Thank, thank you all for being here with me. I'm presenting tonight some new research, research that means a lot to me and a lot to the people who've been involved in it. And I want to just acknowledge that this research is a collaborative and a collective project. I also want to acknowledge you, the audience, and I recognize that many of you here are involved in projects that are about trying to transform institutions like universities to make them more open and inclusive spaces. And I want to thank you for being part of this effort. So I'm going to be talking today about complaint as diversity work. A complaint can be what you have to make because of how a space is occupied. I am speaking to a woman of color academic. She has set up a writing group in her department because she wanted to create a more collaborative research culture but the meetings became dominated by senior men. What I found in each of the meetings were senior men who were bullying everyone in the room. The bullying took the form of the constant belittling of the work of more junior academics as well as postgraduate students. The first session, someone was being just really abusive about someone's PhD, saying it was rubbish. Racist comments are made. I'm from London and London is just ripe for ethnic cleansing. She described how people laughed and how that laughter filled the room. Ableist and sexist comments are made. A woman is described as obviously mentally ill. She comments on these comments. These were the sorts of things being aired. These were the sorts of things, sentences as sentencing, violence thrown out as how some are thrown out. These were the sorts of things being aired, even the air can be occupied. So what do you do? What to do? She decided to make a complaint because she wanted it recorded and because the culture was being reproduced for new PhD students. A complaint becomes a recording device. You have to record what you do not want to reproduce. She gathered statements from around 20 people in her department. So a complaint can be a feminist collective. A meeting is set up in response to her complaint. And at that meeting, she is described by the head of human resources as having a chip on her shoulder, as if she made the complaint because she suffers from a personal grudge. She adds, they treated the submission as an act of arrogance on my part. 
It is as if she put a complaint forward as a way of putting herself forward. A complaint is heard as self-promotional. One way a complaint is heard or not heard is to discredit the complainer as if the problems she identifies is a problem with her. Her complaint goes nowhere. The issues are, in her terms, swept under the carpet, covered up, covered over. When those who try to stop a culture from being reproduced are stopped, a culture is being reproduced. A complaint about what is going on within a, univers within a university can provide us with an alternative catalogue of the university. Complaints can teach us how a university is built. So in today's lecture, I want to think about complaint as diversity work. We become diversity workers when we try to dismantle the structures that are not built to accommodate us. Complaint. That word can bring up a history. The word complaint derives from Old French, meaning to lament, a lament, an expression of sorrow and grief from Latin lamentum, wailing, moaning, weeping. Complaint seems to catch how those who challenge power become sites of negation. You become a container of negative affect, one that is leaky, speaking out as spilling over. So I'll be drawing today on data I've been collecting for a new project on complaint. I was inspired to do this project after taking part in a series of inquiries into sexual harassment and sexual misconduct prompted by a collective complaint lodged by students, some of whom are now early career academics, which is to say, this project was inspired by students and this lecture is for you. I learnt so much from the work you did to keep that complaint going. I have since conducted interviews with and received written testimonies from those who understand themselves in some way to have been involved in a complaint process within a university, and that includes former students, students, early career academics, senior academics, retired academics, and administrators. In last week's lecture, I interrogated how universities are built by thinking through the uses of use. Once assembled, it can seem that universities are as they are. You come to know how being as they are is work when your work is to change how things are. I have found the framework of uses of use useful in my study of complaint, as it's helped me to reflect on the significance of where and how complaints are lodged. So this first section is called Institutional Mechanics. So in considering the uses of use, I worked with a number of companion images that allowed me to explore how use can be a biography, a way of telling a story about things. These examples included a used book, use leaves traces in places, the world traveled path, the more a path is used, the more a path is used, the unused path, you can hardly see the sign for the leaves, a broken cup, when something is broken, it is taken out of use. An occupied toilet sign, a sign tells us that it's currently being used. And a post box that has become a nest. Queer use, when something is used by those for whom it was not intended. Some of these examples will return today with some new ones. They allow us to show how institutions are shaped by use. Institutions have post boxes, paths, communication systems, transportation systems. Institutions are furnished. Tables and chairs are how some are seated, how spaces are occupied. When you say you treat people like furniture, you mean that you put them into the background. Diversity work allows us to attend to the furniture, to what usually recedes. To front up to what recedes is to become conscious of use, patterns of use tend to go unnoticed until they are contested. We might think back to another example introduced in the literature of the lock that works better after being used or from being used. The passage of the key is made smoother by use. 
You might use the lock to lock a door. Locks lead us to doors. For instance, to stop the wrong people from entering. Doors are not just physical things that swing on hinges, though they are that. They are also mechanisms that enable an opening and a closing. If you don't have the right key, and a body can be a key, using the lock would not smooth the passage of the key, but damage the lock and the key. For those without the key, a locked door might as well be a wall. It would be what stopped your progression. So walls came up a lot in my data on diversity. One practitioner described diversity work as a banging your head against a brick wall job. Banging your head, that's quite an encounter and it can be one that happens again and again. And if your head gets sore, what happens to the wall? All it seems is that you scratch the surface, diversity work scratching the surface. If walls kept coming up in my data on diversity, as you'll hear today, doors come up a lot in my data on complaint. So diversity work is often mechanical. You have to work out how a system works in order to transform that system. Making a complaint can also require becoming an institutional mechanic. You have to work out how to get a complaint through a system. It is because of the difficulty of getting through that a complaint often ends up being, as it were, about the system. Now, this point might seem counterintuitive given that organisations have complaint policies and procedures. Surely, to make a complaint is to follow the procedure for making a complaint. In fact, listening to those who have made or tried to make formal complaints has taught me that the gap between what is supposed to happen and what does happen is densely populated. Complaint is a mind the gap. So many universities in the UK include, as part of their complaint policies, a discussion of how they will record and monitor complaints. One university writes that complaints will assist in identifying problems and trends across the university. And then, I think in the next sentence, they write that Complaints will form the basis of positive publicity, demonstrating that identified issues have been resolved. So when a complaint records a problem, a complaint can be quickly folded into a solution, a record of how universities have resolved something, resolution, dissolution. Complaints can thus be used in a similar way to diversity, as a way of appearing to address a problem. A complaint procedure is often represented as a flow chart. This is especially true in the UK for student complaints. Flow, flow, away we go, with paths and arrows, which give the would-be complainant a route through, depending on what happens at each stage of the process. <coughs> I spoke to one administrator about her work in supporting students through the complaint process. She says, so your first stage would require the complainant to try and resolve it informally, which is really difficult in some situations and which is where it might get stuck in a department. And so it takes a really tenacious complaining student to say, no, I am being blocked. If something bad has happened and you're not feeling that way inclined, you can understand why a student would not have the tenacity to make sure that happens and to advocate for themselves. They might go to the student union and the student union is really bogged down, or they might go to the central complaints office and they get a very bureaucratic response back and get put off. So you can imagine that something on paper that looks very linear is actually very circular a lot of the time. And I think that's the problem. Students get discouraged and get demoralised and feel hard done by, and nothing's getting resolved. And then they are in a murky place and they can't get out. They can't get out. So if a procedure exists to clear a path, that path can be blocked at any point. And blockages can occur through conversations. If those you speak to are bogged down, your complaint too gets bogged down. A conversation can function rather like a wall. A complaint can feel like talking to a wall. A complaint then is not simply an outcome of a no. A complaint requires you keep saying no along the way. And this practitioner acknowledges very carefully, I think, that what is required 
to proceed with a complaint, in her terms, confidence and tenacity might be what is eroded by the very experiences that lead you to complaint, something bad has happened, not feeling that way inclined. So unsurprisingly then, stopping is part of the life course or the biography of a complaint. One problem identified in some of my interviews is the relative inaccessibility of policies and procedures. One student describes, it took us forever to try and find the complaints procedure PDF on the database. We knew it existed, but it was like a mythical golden egg. We just couldn't find it. And then we did. It was so big that even two PhD students spent a week trying to get through the small print to find out what the complaints process was. So if you can't find the policy, you can't follow the path laid out as procedure. Or if you do find it, but it's hard to use, user unfriendly, you might be discouraged. The less a path is used, the less a path is used. You can hardly see the sign for the leaves. Complaints can also be stopped by how they are heard. One academic describes what followed when students made a complaint about the behaviour of professors at a research events. A meeting is set up. They said they would have an open meeting, but it was just about calming the students down. You can indicate you are willing to hear a complaint in order to dissolve a complaint. My example last week of a diversity policy that was agreed without coming into use suggested that an organisation can say yes to a new policy when there is not enough behind that yes to bring something about. So perhaps an organisation can allow a no to be expressed when that no has nowhere to go. Venting is then used as a technique of preventing something more explosive from happening, you let a complaint be expressed in order that it can be contained. Once the students have vented their frustrations, once they have got the complaint out of their system, the complaint is out of the system. I think this mechanism functions rather like a pressure relief valve that releases just enough pressure so that it does not build up and cause an explosion. And I'll return to explosions in my conclusion. Complaints can also be stopped by the use of warnings. A warning is an ominous sign, a sign of the danger to come. A warning can function rather like a singular exclamation point. We know what it means by how it is used. Use as instruction. Stop. One student describes, I was also told that if I made a formal complaint, this was the head of department, I had to think about my career. Another said, I ended up going back to the chair and saying, look, this is harassment and I'm going to file a complaint. And his response was essentially, well, we are just thinking about your career, how this will affect you in the future. The implication in both quotes is that to proceed with a formal complaint is not to think about your career. Being advised not to complain is offered as career advice. And your career is evoked as a companion who needs to be looked after. Maybe your career is like a plant that needs watering so that it does not wither away. If your career would wither as a consequence of complaining, then complaining is figured in advance as carelessness, even as negligence. And then if a complaint does not go well, it is as if you brought that situation upon yourself. Sometimes warnings are used as threats that you will lose the connections you need to progress. Another student describes, I was repeatedly told that rocking the boat or making waves would affect my career in the future and that I would ruin the department for everyone else. I was told if I did put in a complaint, I would never be able to work in the university and that it was likely I wouldn't get a job elsewhere. So complaining is framed as self-damage as well as to damage to others ruining a department no less. This student describes for us how the pressure not to complain was exerted. In just one day I was subjected to eight hours of gruelling meetings and questioning, almost designed to break me and stop me from taking the complaint any further. So a wall can be what comes up or a wall can be what comes down, a ton of bricks. You can stop people from doing something by making it harder for them to do something. This student also told me that during the meeting, the head of department referred 
a number of times to his source of funding. A veiled or not so veiled threat to withdraw support for that funding if she went ahead with a complaint. The head of the department also offered a bribe in the form of money for a conference, a feminist conference. <laughs> Threats and bribes. So much bullying surrounds a complaint, what we might call institutional bullying. Is this familiar? The use of threats and bribes to try and persuade us from a course of action to which we are committed. During the strike, we have witnessed how quickly management can and will use such bullying tactics, threats and bribes. It has been heartening to witness how such institutional bullying has been publicly exposed and challenged through collective activism. The bullying that surrounds complaints is difficult to expose because of how complaints become confidential as soon as they are lodged. This student described how there's this assumption that when you put in a complaint in an academic setting, everyone is very convivial, and how for her, right from the start, the viciousness, a word she used repeatedly throughout this interview, was already starting to kick in. Complaints can also be stopped after complaints have been lodged. Another method is to declare a complaint not a complaint because it does not fulfil the requirements for being a complaint. For example, a member of staff made a complaint about bullying from her head of department. This experience of bullying had been devastating and she'd suffered from depression as a result. It took her a long time where she could get to the point where she could even write a complaint. So some of the experiences that we might complain about are some of the experiences that make it difficult to complain. <coughs> she describes what happens when she put in her complaint. I basically did it when I was able to because I was just really unwell for a significant period of time. And I put in the complaint and the response that I got was from the deputy VC. He said he couldn't process my complaint <coughs> because I had taken too long to lodge it. <coughs> Some experiences are so devastating they take time to process them and the length of time taken can be used to disqualify the complaint itself. If organisations can disqualify complaints because they take too long to make, they can also take too long themselves to respond to complaints. One student described how the university took seven months to respond to her complaint, and then another seven months to respond to her response to their response to her complaint. In both cases, they were supposed to take a maximum of three months. She has a theory. It is my theory they've been putting in the long finger and pulling this out, dragging this out over unacceptable periods of time to try and tire me out so that I would just give up. Sometimes it can seem that exhaustion is not just the effect, but the point of a complaint process. Exhaustion as a management technique, tiring people out they are too tired to address what makes them too tired. Thus far I've received numerous accounts of complaints that are lodged as complaints and still nothing happens. Perhaps complaints sit there rather like that diversity policy I referred to last week, becoming unusable by not being used, dusty, a post box as a filing cabinet, a complaint is filed away. One student said of her complaint, it gets shoved in a box. That box could be a bin or perhaps even a coffin. Another student described, I feel like my complaint has gone into the complaint graveyard. A filing cabinet as a graveyard. There's a ghostly promise in that. One academic made a complaint about sexism to her head of department. And his response to her was, I would like to throw that issue in the dustbin. The response to a complaint is a rubbishing of a complaint, which is to say, a rubbishing of what the complaint is about. It is sexism that enables sexism to be treated as rubbish, racism that enables racism to be treated as rubbish, and so on. So you encounter what you complain about when you complain about what you encounter. When a complaint is filed away or binned, those who complain can feel like they too have been filed away or binned. We need to remember that a complaint is a record of what happens to a person. Complaints are personal. Complaints are also institutional records. They are records of what happens in an institution. Complaints are institutional. The personal is institutional. To file a complaint can mean to become alienated
from your own history, a history that can be difficult, painful, and traumatic. So this next section is called A Complaint Biography. So my project began as a project on formal complaints. I wanted to follow complaints around to give them, as it were, a biography. But early on, I realized that this tightening of the complaint genre, a complaint as a requirement to fill in a form, is how many struggles are not recorded. We have our own complaint biographies, our ways of relating to the institutions that accommodate us, which might include moments of crisis when you have to decide whether or not to say something in response to what is being done or not being done. We might carry our complaints with us, whether or not we make them. I spoke to one academic about how she came to a decision about whether to complain about the conduct of senior members of the university, including heads of departments and a pro vice chancellor around a table. She was the only woman at the table. She describes for us what happened. They were talking about women's bodies, what they look like, what they do to them as men, what they would do to them, very sexual, very sexist jokes, very sexually overt conversation, and I was sitting there as if I was not there. It was a distressing experience for her, in part because she had previously assumed that the university was as progressive as it said it was. She took the matter up by speaking to another Pro Vice Chancellor and the Director of Human Resources. I had a hearing with both of them, but I think it was just to placate me. Being placated is another way a complaint can be stopped. When a listener appears sympathetic, they might be nodding. <laughs> I'm trying to do a nod, but it's not very successful. <laughs> but does nothing. A nod can almost function like a door. I've used the category of the non-performative, primarily, primarily to refer to speech acts when something is named without coming into existence, or when something is named in order not to bring it into existence. A body, too, can appear to act. A nod can operate in the realm of the non-performative. A nod can be made in order not to do anything. When these senior managers did not do anything, and not doing needs to be understood here as an action, not merely inaction, she decided not to take the complaint any further, not to, to use her verb, not to pursue it. And she came to that decision in part because of what had happened at her previous institution. She had supported a number of students who had filed a complaint against a male lecturer for sexual misconduct and sexual harassment. I think I just suddenly thought, that this is too much. And I had just come from an institution where I had spearheaded a group of students making a complaint against a lecturer. We took it all the way to the top, and the lecturer got off. He got off despite the evidence. In this case, 10 students had provided first-hand testimony. And it was this experience of not getting anywhere that led her to decide not to make that complaint formal about the conduct of these senior managers around that table. We carry complaints with us, which means that if a complaint is stopped, that stoppage can lead to yet more stoppages down the line. So a complaint can take us back, back further still. The story of a complaint can begin before you say anything. It can be about how you do not fit, how you are not attuned to the requirements of an organization. A complaint as a misfit genre, to use that term misfit again, from Rosemary Gallon Thompson's important work. When you are not attuned, you might have to work to become attuned. Diversity can be a requirement to become more attuned to an organization. You might end up on the diversity committee because of who you are not, not white, not cis, not able-bodied, not man, not straight. The more nots you are, the more committees you end up on. But you can be a misfit on these committees. An academic describes, I was on the Equality and Diversity group in the university, and as soon as I started mentioning things to do with race, they changed the portfolio of who could be on the committee, and I was dropped. Even to mention the word race as a woman of colour is to be heard as complaining. If you embody diversity, you're supposed to do that work with a smile. There are words that are heard as too confrontational, too abrasive, too much, too, too, she added, whenever you raise something, the response is, 
that you are not one of them. Such a powerful utterance. Not one of them. A complaint might be necessary because you do not fit and a complaint seems to amplify what makes you not fit, picking up on what you are not. Perhaps a not is heard as shouting, as insistence, a stress point, a sore point, a complaint, when a not becomes an exclamation point. As Leela Whitley and Tiffany Page have observed, when a woman files an objection to sexual harassment, she becomes, in the language of the institution, a woman who complains, and by extension, a complainer, becoming a complainer. Another academic describes how becoming a complainer can take you away from your work. If you have a situation, you make a complaint, then you are the woman who complains, the lesbian who complains, and it gets in the way of being in the role, being a good colleague, a good mentor, a great teacher, a supervisor. And you can feel that change in your voice and the dynamic in meetings. And you don't like to hear yourself talking like that, but you end up being in that situation again. And you think, it's me, and then no, it's systematic, and you think, it's me the conversation you have with yourself. It's me, it's a system, it's me, it's a system. That conversation takes time, time away from your work, time that becomes work. And it can feel like everything is just spinning around, spinning around, spilling. Maybe you reach a point, a breaking point, when it all just spills out. You might fly off the handle rather like that broken cup is coming up again. You become the one who can't handle things. She, de she describes for us further, and then of course you get witch hunted, you get scapegoated, you become the troublesome uppity woman, you become the woman who does not fit, you become everything the bully accuses you of, because nobody is listening to you. And you hear yourself starting to take that, not petulant tyrant, bangs the table, come on! You can hear them saying, oh, there you go. I shared last week a quote from a diversity practitioner who said she only had to open her mouth in meetings to witness eyes rolling as if to say, oh, here she goes. Both times we laughed. It can be a relief to have an experience put into words. And it was from experiences like this that I developed my equation, rolling eyes equals feminist pedagogy. It can be exhausting. Sometimes you have to complain in order to be able to enter a room. Another academic described how she has to keep pointing out that rooms are inaccessible because they keep booking rooms that are inaccessible. She says, I worry about drawing attention to myself, but this is what happens when you hire a person in a wheelchair. There have been major access issues at the university. And she spoke of the drain, the exhaustion, the sense of why should I have to be the one who speaks out? You have to speak out because others do not. And because you speak out, others can justify their own silence. They hear you, so it becomes about you. Major access issues become your issues. You have to keep saying it because they keep doing it. A complaint is then treated as a broken record, as if she's stuck on the same point. But you say what you say because they do what they do. A complaint is not a starting point. To make a complaint informally or formally is to complain about something that precedes the complaint. And what precedes the complaint can be what stops you from getting through. One student gives an account of turning up at a postgraduate retreat. She's been away from the department for some time and she senses that something has shifted. It was a cultural shift I recognised as I came through the doors. There was a lot of touching going on, shoulder rubs and knee pats. It was the dialogue. They were making jokes, jokes that were horrific. They were doing it in a very small space in front of staff and nobody was saying anything. And it felt like my reaction to it was out of kilter with everyone else. It felt really disconnected, the way I felt about the way they were behaving and the way everybody else was laughing. They were talking about milking bitches. I still can't quite get to the bottom of where the jokes were coming from. Nobody was saying anything about it. People were just laughing along. You can open a door and be hit by it, a change in atmosphere, intrusions into personal space, words that are sent out and about. The sexist expression milking bitches seem to have a history. And each time that expression is used, that history is thrown out like a line, a line that you have to follow if you are to get anywhere. When laughter fills the room like water in a cup, laughter as holding something, it can feel like there's no room left. 
To experience such jokes as offensive is to become alienated, not only from the jokes, but the laughter that surrounds them, propping them up, giving them somewhere to go. She describes further. You start to stand out in that way. You're just not playing along. He was doing things, I think, to try and provoke me to react to him. I think he was doing it under the guise of humour. But he specifically went for me verbally at a table where everyone was eating lunch. It was a large table with numerous account amounts of people around it, including staff. I was having quite a personal conversation with someone and he literally leant across the table, physically came forward. He, he was slightly ajar to me. He was really close and said, oh my God, I can see you ovulating. A complaint can be heard before she even says anything, just by not laughing, by not going along with it, she comes to stand out. Because she does not find the jokes funny, because she is not condoning the behaviour, because she is not happy with what is going on, he then comes after her. So the violence is channelled, in the room is channelled in her direction. Her personal space invaded, words flung out, flung out, she's reduced to body, pulled back, woman as ovary. She's not allowed to do her own thing, to be a student, to have a conversation with others. Words can be how spaces are occupied, how bodies take up spaces as if those spaces belong to them. Sometimes, as in this case, a sign tells us that the toilet is in use, that the room is occupied. Rooms can also be occupied without the use of signs to indicate that they are. Universities can be occupied, but the signs do not tell us that they are or how they are. In fact, the signs might be telling us something else. The university, after all, has policies on harassment that are supposed to disallow the use of demeaning sexist and racist expressions. A policy is a sign. A policy can be about what ought not to exist. Think back to the example of a diversity policy that came into existence without coming into use. Policies, even if they are not in use, can be used as evidence of what does not exist. So when cases of sexual harassment become public, they are often met by statements like, we do not tolerate sexual harassment. Or when cases of racism are made public, they are often met by statements like, we are committed to diversity, as if saying it makes it so. The idea that something should not exist, or even that something does not exist because it should not exist, might be how something stays in use. Norms can operate all the more forcefully by not appearing to exist. This student described what followed her own experience. I think the staff member knew I was deeply upset by it. I pretty much left the table and he, the staff member, followed me out and started the conversation. And this is probably in hindsight where it started to get difficult. In that staff member started to lean on me. Immediately he said to me, oh, you know what he's like. He's got a really strange sense of humour. He didn't mean anything by it. And the implication was I was being a bit oversensitive and that I couldn't take a joke and that I need to sort of forget about it and move on. She leaves the table. And note that there is an effort to stop her from complaining about the situation in the situation. She is told not to say anything, not to be oversensitive, not to do anything, not to cause trouble. And this is how banter is often used as a frame to justify use as if words can be stripped from a history. A use can be sustained by a fantasy that a use has been suspended. So when we say norms can operate all the more forcefully by not appearing to exist, we are talking about the creation of an obligation not to experience norms as norms, as impositions and restrictions, not to experience some forms of expression as demeaning, not even to experience harassment as harassment. The one who experiences harassment as harassment is understood then as bringing the problem into existence. And then you are harassed all the more. You are harassed because you perceived something as harassment. The staff member, by leaning in this way, positions himself with the harasser, treating the verbal onslaught as a joke, something she should just take, keep taking. The kind of line here would be, get used to it or get out of it. So the harasser physically comes forward, the staff member leans on her. The response to harassment is harassment. This powerful testimony gives us a glimpse, I think, of how a complaint is an experience of not fitting 
given expression. A complaint is in the middle of something, right in the thick of it. Violence is channeled toward a complainer or would-be complainer, a potential complainer, as punishment for identifying that violence or even for experiencing something as being violent. I've only shared with you a fragment of her story. She did not just leave the table, she left the academy. And she left in part because of what she learnt about the institution from how it responded to her complaint. She describes the process for us. I lost my rose tinted glasses, the way I saw those spaces being a place of excellence. I thought they were welcoming of difference. I'd worked really hard to get to that space. When you come from the kind of background I have, no one had been to university to do a degree. I've noted in my work how diversity can be a way of not addressing something. Diversity can also be used as an address, welcoming of difference. Diversity might be represented as an open door. Students from diverse backgrounds are welcome. Come in, come in. Diversity as a tagline. Tag along, tagged on. Come in, come in. I think back to our post box. There could be another sign on that post box, birds welcome. The sign birds welcome would be a non-performative if the post box was still in use because the birds would be dislodged by the letters the nest destroyed before it could be created. I noted last week that use is a restriction of possibility that is material. You can use the paper for some things and not others because of the material qualities of paper. So we are learning here how restrictions can be made through use or even enforced by use. The letters in the box, the words that are thrown out, they become materials, they pile up. They stop others from making use of something. What is material to some, leaving you with no room, no room to breathe, to be, to nest, can be what does not matter to others because it does not get in the way of their occupation of space. Indeed, it might even enable their occupation. So you can stop others from using a space by how a space is being used, by what a space is being used for, that for, can become a door. This is the third section called Closing the Door. Doors. They keep coming up. One academic, <coughs> one academic described her department as a revolving door. Women and minorities arrive only to head right back out again. Whoosh, whoosh. You might have to get it out because of what you find out when you get in. A door can also be what stops you from getting out. I'm speaking to an academic about the first complaint she made when she was a postgraduate student. One of the lecturers on her program had been making her feel uncomfortable. So one time she enters his room. And then one afternoon I went into his office to talk to him about something. It was an office a bit like this, but without any glass, with a door that opened inwards and opened on a latch. And he pushed me against the back of the door and tried to kiss me. And I pushed him away. It was an instinctive pushed him away and tried to get out of the room. And it was a horrible moment because I realized I couldn't actually. It was very difficult to operate the latch. We are back to the door, the back of a door. A door that glass solid can't be seen through. A door is what you're pushed against. The latch that won't open, getting stuck, trying to get out. The work you have to do to get out. She did get out of his room, but it was hard. Behind closed doors, harassment happens there out of view in secret. You can be locked in, locked out. That door is a teacher. It teaches us the significance of having to make a complaint about harassment in the same place where the harassment happened. A door is shut on her. The same door is shut on a complaint, the same door. She submits an informal complaint, a letter detailing the assault, and that would now in our current procedures be the first stage of a formal complaint process. Where does her complaint go? Her letter ends up with the Dean. And what does he do? The Dean basically told me I should sit down and have a cup of tea with this guy to sort it out. So often the response to a complaint about harassment is to minimise harassment as if what occurred is just a minor squabble between two parties, something that can be sorted out by a cup of tea, that English signifier of reconciliation. A complaint would then become a failure, your failure, to resolve the situation more amicably, am, 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 I can't even say that word, 
Amicably. A complaint, in other words, is your failure stopping something from reaching a happier solution. She does not proceed to a formal complaint. So her complaint was stopped. He was not. Now, I say her complaint was stopped rather than she was stopped because she did go on to have an academic career and she is now a professor. But this experience of being harassed and assaulted when she was a student stayed with her. She describes... I thought I got a first because of academic merit, but then after this happened, I remember thinking, but hang on, maybe not. Maybe this was some sort of ruse to try and keep me in this institution so we could keep the contact going. It starts undermining your own sense of your academic merit, the quality of your work and all that kind of stuff. Being harassed by a lecturer can damage your sense of self-worth, intellectual worth, leading you to question yourself, doubt yourself. Her complaint was stopped, she was not but she carries that history with her. Her complaint was stopped. He was not. So what happens to him? She tells us. He was a known harasser. There were lots of stories told about him. I had a friend who was very vulnerable. He took advantage of that. She ended up taking her own life. She ended up taking her own life. So much more pain, so much more damage at the edges of this woman's story of damage. He went on, he was allowed to go on when her complaint and for all we know, there were others too. We do not know how many said no, did not stop him. He has since retired, much respected by his peers. No blemish on his record. There isn't, I checked. No blemish on his record. No blemish on the institutional record. The damage carried by those who did complain or would complain if they could complain is carried around like baggage, slow, heavy down. To hear complaint is to hear from those weighed down by a history that has not left a trace in the official records. Damage to a person is deflected by being treated as damage to the institution, reputational damage, and damage to a person if a person is identified by the complaint. And that damage is often evoked through or as concern, concern for consequence for how much he or they would have to lose career, status, standing, and so on. So organisations become aligned with those who abuse power by virtue of the position they have been given because they share an interest in stopping what is recorded by a complaint from getting out. Another student said, it is like you are complaining to your abuser. The institution in protecting an abuser takes his place. And I would add here that when that protection fails, when an abuse of power is exposed, usually after much activism and work, usually led by students, the figure of the abuser is transformed very quickly into that of the stranger or even the foreigner as being inexpressive rather than expressive of the values of the organisation. To stop him does require, would require, transforming the very system that enabled him, that is built to enable him. A complaint this teaches us about the continuity of abuses of power with the use patterns, as I've been calling it, of an institution. And by use pattern, I'm precisely not referring to official policies or procedures. I'm referring instead to how universities are occupied, how a network can come alive to stop a complaint from getting through, rather like how electricity travels through wire, hiring as wiring. Hiring as wiring, how data is transmitted through organisations, the speed with which some information travels has something to do with how they are built to meet some people's requirements. So paths into an organisation, hiring, become paths through an organisation, wiring. When a circuit is broken, its conductive elements would no longer form a complete path. A complaint becomes a crisis for an organisation because or when it threatens to break a circuit. A complaint can then function like a switch, an alarm or an alert that triggers a reaction so when a network comes alive, it is in order to protect those who are the most networked, which is to say, a network is how the complaint is stopped. And when I say a network comes alive, I'm not suggesting that activity is coordinated by one person or a group of people who are meeting in secret, although I do think secret meetings do happen. Meetings do not need to happen. What does not get out is built in. The more a path is used, the more a path is used. The more he is sighted, the more he is sighted. The more he is connected, the more he is connected. 
The more he is connected, the more others are invested in that connection. The body of a professor becomes then a conductor. Information and energy and resources travel through him. He becomes the path, one that works rather like a funnel. The path becomes narrower and narrower at the exit point. You have to go through him to get anywhere. Uses of use, a restriction of possibility that has become material. Uses of use, a narrowing of the roots. The more a path is used, the less paths there are to use, more going through less. More going through less. A complaint is then treatable as a loose connection, as what will potentially stop not just him, but more, more and more, from receiving something through him. One student describes how her complaint was framed by her peers. We were accused of having caused the disruption in their studies. They valued their desire to have him as a professor over those who were suffering psychologically because of his harassment. We need to be in solidarity with those whose education was now being disrupted, not the other way around. So a complaint is framed as a failure to share that connection, a lack of solidarity with others who are cut off from the source of information and energy. I think we could also think the feminist killjoy as a loose connection. She deprives others of what would follow a shared connection causing damage by virtue of not being properly attached. So I suggested last week that some had paths cleared for them. The clearing of a path we learn can involve, does involve, has involved the clearing of complaints, clearing as clearing up. When one MA student made a complaint about the conduct of the most senior member of her department. She was told by the convener of the program, be careful, he is an important man. He is an important man. This declaration functions not only as an explicit warning, tread carefully, it won't end well, and as an appeal, be kind, be nice, he matters. But I suspect also as a justification that has a circular route. He does this because he's an important man, because he's an important man, he does this. This student went ahead with a complaint. <clears throat> in her terms, she sacrificed the references. In reference to the prospect of doing a PhD, she said, that door is closed. That door is closed. References too can function as doors, mechanisms that enable an opening or a closing, how it is made possible for some to progress, others not. Reference systems are paper trails, letters sent out that might reach their destination. They are about how some are enabled by connections, how some gather speed and velocity more and more, faster and faster. He is an important man. References can be withheld or they can offer faint praise. When praise is faint, a no is expressed. A no can be how someone has nowhere to go. Many do not make complaints because they feel they cannot afford to lose the references, to lose the connection. In fact, it's the most common reason given to me thus far. Note also then that the punishment for complaint can entail the withdrawal of support. To withdraw support is enough to stop someone from going somewhere. A complaint teaches us then how power can work through what might seem to be a very light touch. The mere lift of a supportive hand can function as the heaviest of weights. Not being supported as much as you would have been supported can be how you are stopped. Power manifests as withdrawal of support for those who show how power manifests. So this is my conclusion, lifting the lid. I have shared with you a tiny amount of the data I have collected on complaint. And I think in these accounts we have so much institutional wisdom we have a way of understanding how power works drawn from the experiences of those who challenge how power works. We have insights into why many do not complain drawn from the experiences of those who do. We know that to experience something as harassment or bullying, let alone to formalise that experience into a complaint, can lead to more harassment and bullying. Many do not complain because of how it's made costly to complain, and yet many have complained. We are here as women, people of colour, as LGBTQI folk, as people with disabilities, because those before us complained. So to describe the work of complaint is to account for how it becomes possible through work to inhabit spaces that were not intended for us, 
complaint as diversity work, complaint also as queer use. In listening to complaints, we are also learning about stoppages. A system is working by stopping those who are trying to transform the system. And this means that to transform a system, we have to stop the system from working. We might have to throw a wrench in the works or to become, to use Sarah Franklin's terms, wenches in the works. To throw our bodies into the system, to try and stop the same old bodies from being assembled, doing the same old things. I think of a diversity worker as a non-reproductive agent. We are trying to stop what usually happens from happening, trying not to reproduce an inheritance. To stop a machine from working is to damage the machine. When I shared my reasons for resigning from my post in protest at the failure of the institution to address sexual harassment as an institutional problem, I quickly became the cause of damage. I became a leaky pipe. Drip, drip. <laughs> Organisations will try and contain that damage. The response, in other words, is damage limitation. And this is how diversity, too, often takes <coughs> institutional form, damage limitation. Happy, shiny policies will be put in place. Holes left by departures will be filled without reference to what went on before. Indeed, there is often a blur of activity, and that blur is important, after an exposure of a problem, remember creating evidence of doing something is not the same thing as doing something. One academic I spoke to described how the university now has a very nice patch on its intranet telling staff what happened and it all looks cleaner than clean because of all the action they've taken in the past six months and frankly, they haven't addressed the situation at all. Cleaning up, a complaint becomes a mess something to be mocked up in a way, often by the very appearance of doing something. Even new complaint procedures, however important, and they are important, can be used in this way, as evidence of what has been done, as distractions from what is not being done. I think of mops, mopping up, mopping away. And there is hope here, because they cannot mop up all of the mess. A leak can be a lead. A leak can be a feminist lead. When I shared my reasons for my resignation, many people shared with me their own stories, their own institutional battles. When you lift a lid, more and more comes out. And in a way, this project came from that experience. So it might seem <clears throat> that complaints do not, that do not get anywhere disappear without a trace, rather like that unused path, hard to find, harder to follow you can hardly see the sign for the leaves. But in saying no, we keep a history alive. We do not let go. Feminist memory can be a counter-institutional project. We have to find ways of creating paths for others to follow, to leave traces in places. We have to work together as well, I would say, to ensure that making a complaint does not mean closing a door. Support needs to be public to create a feminist public. One student who made a complaint about harassment from another student commented on how the support was all being done discreetly. I felt like that was the exact opposite of how it should be dealt with. It was like this secret little thing we have got to fix. Support needs to be loud, not quiet, not secret, not behind closed doors, not in the same places that the harassment happened. A leak can be a lead. Complaints that do not seem to get anywhere can still lead us to each other. Those who make complaints often end up finding out about others who made complaints before them. Complaint as a kind of intergenerational intimacy. One student made an informal complaint about racism and white supremacy in her classroom. Using those kind of terms for what is here does get you into trouble. And she knew that, but she was willing to do that. But she became, in her terms, a monster, an indigenous feminist monster. And she is now completing her PhD off campus. She said that an unexpected little gift was how other students could come to her. They know you are out there and they can reach out to you. And she used that expression a number of times, an unexpected little gift. Another student described becoming aware of previous complaints about sexual harassment in part through the response to their own complaint 
about harassment. The scale of the response was so extreme in a way, compared to what we were complaining about. Now on reflection, I guess it was because there were hundreds of complaints they had suppressed that they did not want to have a lid lifted on it. When you lift the lid, more and more complaints come out. Even what has been binned can acquire another life. It can be explosive what comes out. We need more explosions. And of course, this is why professional norms of conduct are about keeping a lid on it. Silence as institutional loyalty, silence in case of institutional damage, if that is the case, we need to become unprofessional, unprofessional feminists. And yes, much of this data, if released, would be damaging to an organisation's reputation. If it would be, it should be. But no wonder it's made hard to release that data. To release that data often requires using alternative methods, other paths of communication at the back of the organisation perhaps, not following the usual procedures, because following the usual procedures is how we are stopped from getting the information out. And so we might write the names of harassers in books, we might distribute leaflets, we might gather in protest to reclaim spaces that have become unavailable because of how they are used. And when we gather, we speak to each other. We often end up doing this kind of work because we've exhausted the usual procedures. But that work, however much it originates from or with exhaustion, will still be framed as vandalism. I noted last week how decolonizing the curriculum is framed as vandalism and protest too is often framed in this way, as vandalism, damage to property. A frame has consequences. Those who use such methods will be disciplined for not working in the right way. I've been examining public statements and confidential letters that assume this disciplinary form, where not following the usual procedures has been identified as damaging organisations and even in some cases as damaging feminism. And when people refer to usual procedures or due process, they also often mean in-house. One letter recommended, for instance, that rather than making a public disclosure, a better route would have been to call a meeting with other professors in order to avoid, quote, a fallout which damages us all now and for the future. We have a problem when another meeting is imagined to be a solution to the problem. Working in-house so often ends up being a restoration project polishing the furniture so it appears less damaged. I've called this labour, with reference to uses of diversity, institutional polishing. In house, the master's house, we could remember Lord, always remember Audrey Lord. The master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. Of course, we have limited options and sometimes we have to use the tools that are available to us, chipping away the best we can. Sometimes we do what is required. We might even be willing to reflect the good image the institution has of itself, back to itself. But we have to be careful not to lose ourselves in that reflection. You have to be careful not to lose yourself in that reflection. We do not want to polish away the scratches, the stains. They are testimony. Yes, those scratches, we are back to those scratches. We reach each other through what appears as damage, mere scratch and scribble. But feminism becomes then Writing on the wall, we were here, we did not get used to it. Thank you.